The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Welcome to International Insights. I am G. Doug Davis, and with me is Michael Slobotchkov. On this episode, we'll be speaking with Ambassador Ronald Newman, the President of the American Academy of Diplomacy. He served as United States Ambassador to Afghanistan, Bahrain, and Algeria. He started his career as an Army Infantry Officer in the Vietnam War before joining the State Department in 1970. He is the author of The Other War, Winning and Losing in Afghanistan. He authored a chapter in a forthcoming book on American diplomacy called American Diplomacy Since the Cold War, a recipe for fixing US foreign policy. In 2018, he was presented a lifetime contribution to diplomacy award by the American Foreign Service Association. Ambassador Newman, welcome to the show from Washington. Thank you, pleasure to be with you, at least visually. <laughs> Ambassador Newman, thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to start off the, the questioning uh, by asking, uh, since you have a long experience in the Foreign Service as an ambassador and a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, your government service, st however, started as an infantry officer in Vietnam. Uh, how did your combat experience help you as a diplomat? Well, the military actually does a pretty good job of teaching leadership. And that's a characteristic that is important, has been important throughout my career, probably still is. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that's something they do in basic training, but they did a pretty good job in officer's candidate school. Uh, and then, uh, well, I suppose you grow up, you know, there's nothing like leading in combat to help you grow up. Uh, if you if you survive so uh, that all you know there were a lot of insights there that are very very basic to, you know things like you know don't go in your tent before the other people's tents are up don't cut the chow i mean taking care of your people and not taking special advantage of your rank are basic principles that i think any leader can follow Excellent, excellent. Ambassador Newman, you published an editorial with Mark Grossman and Marcy Rees in The Messenger on July 9th, calling for the State Department to have a reserve. And can you tell us more about that proposal and the benefits it would offer, in particular to situations like the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? Sure. Uh, the State Department has never had a role, a, an ability to surge. What it does with a crisis is to uh, steal people from everywhere else, and they may or may not be suitable. This has gone on for years. Uh, in Lebanon, in the mid-'80s, there was an Israeli invasion. There were something like 14,000 U.S. citizens evacuated. The State Department brought in people to help, but not everyone had the right skills. They had to take people out of separate ports, military and civilian. And fast forward to Afghanistan, you had not just the evacuation, but you had the requirement to meet people all over the states in these military camps. Uh, but you had these same things in the COVID evacuations. And when this happens, when any kind of crisis happens, you need not just bodies, you need bodies with particular skills. So this proposal is modeled very much on the military reserve. The idea that you would build a small cadre, we're only talking about a thousand people, uh, with very particular skills, and it's not just, uh, you know, political officers you need in a crisis. You need people to contract charter flights in a hurry, uh, people to handle all kinds of mer medical issues, American citizen issues. Uh, so you would build that cadre, and like the reserve, they would do regular training, uh, and they would be available, they would be on orders. You, you, you could tell them, you know, this isn't a, would you like to go to outer Mongolia? This is, you're leaving for Bangui on Wednesday, here's your orders. 
Um, and this is a capability the State Department has never had. And in longer term crises, it's one we have really missed because what happens, you pull people out of offices, you leave them empty. Other work goes undone or builds up the workload. Uh, and so this has been a recurring problem. It's really time to fix it. Fantastic. Um, and that argument really leads me to the next question that I have, uh, which is in the chapter that you wrote for Fixing American Diplomacy uh, that, that uh, Dr. Davis and I co-edited, um, you look back over the past 50 years uh, and, and you come up with really two, I think, very important conclusions. One, that uh, more uh, progress can often be made through, into, uh, through um, incremental change uh, than systematic reform. Um, and then the second conclusion really is, is that while big reforms are possible, they must include a long-term plan for making changes over time. They can't be instituted quickly. Uh, what guidelines would you suggest are important for enacting change at the State Department? Well, there two, they, you know, remember the, the reason for those particular conclusions is the nature of our elected government, that the administration changes every four years, and administrations come in and they are initially usually completely taken up with crises, personnel selection, they're, they're often a year or two into their administration before they even start to think about management. Uh, your budget cycle is a yearly budget cycle. It, maybe you should say a yearly free-for-all in the Congress. So you, if you're going to do something long-term, you need an insight, the plan that goes over multiple years Partly because if you have a plan, for instance, on the building of the Reserve Corps, we think it could, you know, we've laid out a plan to do it in five years. But if you have the plan and it slips a little bit, it might, you know, take six or years or seven years to get fully to the end of building the staff you need. But that's okay. You still get there. If you don't have that vision, then every year you have the argument in the budget about whether or not this is something you want to do or whether there's something else that ought to be done. Uh, it's a zero, budgets are zero sum games. And I've sometimes joked that in, in budget warfare, your, your, your victories are temporary and your defeats are final. Uh, so you, because of that budget issue, you need this long-term vision to fill in against. The reason I've argued that more change comes incrementally is because in so many cases, it, it takes a long time to get changed. Administrations don't last a long time. And especially if they get big visions toward the end of the administration, they walk away and their successors don't necessarily pick it up. They start thinking all over again, where if you have smaller changes, you can get them done uh, in your time. So it's, it's not an ironclad rule, but it's an observation of you know, what happens based on the life cycle of political administrations. Excellent. Ambassador Newsom, you identify three perennial conditions that limit American diplomatic approaches to major problems. And in your essay, you identify these as qualities of the American character. And those tensions are the difference between morality and real politic, uh, impatience and the third would be intellectual arrogance, the made in, in Washington solutions. This often leads us to overstate our commitments and leads us to a tension between our words and behavior. What effect does this have for American foreign policy overall? Oh, well, you know, it's like playing, what is it, crack the whip. Uh, we, we snap around a little bit. Uh, now, that, you know, the tension between morality and interest, this goes back to the beginning of the Republic. You know, if, you, if you look at John Adams talking about we support our uh, our vision of democracy, but we go not abroad in, in search of monsters to destroy. He's talking about the balance between how much you intervene, how you support your interests. And 
since America is a country with, you know, with a strong moral impulse and also with limitations on what it can do, you're going to, you're always going to have that tension. I, one of the things that you have to deal with in educating people is that often policy is going to be about managing conflicting intention between interests. Uh, you're not going to be able to have a clear one side, one time uh, ranking of priorities and, and you're done and you can always fit. So that tension is always going to be there. I think American leaders could do a lot better in explaining that tension to people instead of posturing. Uh, but that, you know, nuanced arguments are always harder to make than black and white ones. Um, the issue, I don't know exactly how to deal with these issues. I've observed them over time. One is there's a kind of American feeling that if there's a problem, we can come up with a policy. And, uh, you know, often it's true, but it isn't always true. And when you're dealing, particularly in insurgent situations or situations where the host government has to perform, are inventing strategies that don't have host government buy-in usually leads to their failure. And yet, I don't know, we, we don't seem to have a strong willingness to understand that some things have to be fixed by other people. And if they don't fix them, you're probably going to fail at fixing them. And that's a problem. Uh, you know, this is a, not a new problem. Uh, former CIA Director Colby spent 15 years involved in Vietnam, once observed that many Americans felt the reason for failure there was that the brilliant ideas of Washington were not suitably implemented by the Vietnamese. Um, but, you know, we're not real good at having other people tell us what the solution should be for American problems and then going, you know, we've got to do it ourselves. So a little more humility about what we're capable of doing and probably a lot more focus on the time needed for things uh, is, you know, is an essential requirement. I mean, most major development exercises have taken years. Now, Afghanistan, we failed ultimately. But you, know, you can look back and say, for instance, how long did it take Taiwan to move from a kleptocratic dictatorship to a vibrant, economically successful democracy? You're talking 30, 40 years. Same thing in Korea after the Korean War. Years and years of corrupt governments, kleptocratic governments, military coups. So you have positive examples of countries that have evolved from chaos and corruption to real democratic progress. And you're talking usually 30, 40 years. And so the notion that you could write a plan, and administrations don't really want to hear that, you know. I mean, what's a long term in Washington? It's two years. That's the next congressional election. Um, really long term is four. So when you tell them, uh, yeah, fine, we can do what you want. And we need, you know, about 10 administrations. Um, the usual answer is go back to the drawing board and get me something quicker. Ambassador Newman, you just highlighted one of the problems of uh, implementation. And so I want to turn uh, to Afghanistan, which you mentioned was a <coughs> failure. Um, and we had 10 different policies over a 20 year period. But you identify that the problem was never the policy, it was the implementation. Um, so why is it so difficult for us to get buy in and implement effective policy and to fix things? Well, if I knew that, I'd probably be back in the State Department. But uh, I want to suggest, first of all, that the problem, or at least some responsibility for the problem, begins in academia. That we don't tend, we tend to focus on policy in teaching, and we don't focus on execution. And let me give you a completely hypothetical example. You want to protect roads. So you decide your policy is going to be to arm tribes to help protect them in an insurgency. You could find you had given the arms to people who 
really did a good job when they were attacked. The central government reinforced them. The roads were more secure, and the policy was a great success. You could find, as we found, say, in pipeline security, very similar in Iraq, that they took the arms, they fought with their neighbors for local power, uh, they made deals with the attackers, and the policy is a complete failure. The policy would be identical. The success failure is in the implementation. But look around at how many academic articles do you see dealing with policy that deal with implementation with serious consideration of how long it will take to execute a policy, what kind of resources you need, how do you have to steady down on it. So we don't teach it <coughs> to begin with, and we're not always realistic about it. Uh, and it's going to take, you know, a, a whole major change of thinking, partly because often you get into something without knowing how long it's going to take Afghanistan is a wonderful example. We were attacked on 9-11. 3,000 people died in New York. We went to Afghanistan to kick out Al-Qaeda. And then you find yourself saying, well, okay, now we're here. How do we get out of this? Um, and then you have 10, years, you know, 10 different policies trying to figure out how to, what's your exit strategy. But if you won't look at how long any of your strategies are going to take, uh, you, you're probably going to have the problem recurring. Excellent. Ambassador Newman, while diplomats perform the same tasks today that they did in the 19th century, the technological requirements are different. So most ambassadors and diplomats spend a lot, a, a big portion of their time emailing Washington and receiving information and instead of actually developing contacts and being integrated into their society. How, in your opinion and judgment, has technology impacted diplomacy? Oh, you know, it's expedited a lot of things and it's made other things more complicated. And communication cuts both ways. You know, the, uh, I remember reading about my distant predecessor in Alger, Algeria, the first consul who had to get money from uh, gold from Europe in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars to pay off the Barbary pirates to release American prisoners. He went 13 months once without an instruction. Um, and uh, in fact, at one point, he promised to, to give a frigate to the Algerians if they would extend the period of the troops. I can't imagine what would happen to me if I promised to sell a frigate um, without instructions, let alone give one away. Uh, so that's changed. You know, the, the days when Jefferson noted we have not heard from our minister in Spain in a year. If we don't hear from him in another year, we should write him. Um, well, that's pretty much gone. On the other hand, there's still a lot of room for ambassadorial discretion. Uh, first of all, an active ambassador will play very actively back and forth with Washington, trying to shape his own or her own instructions. Uh, secondly, a lot of things happen on the ground and you don't have time to wait for instructions. Uh, and then you have, of course, so many other issues uh, that diplomats did not have previously. I haven't gotten rid of many, but we've acquired a whole lot. Transnational crime, drugs, climate, you name it. Um, where you need specialized insights, sometimes those have to be people on the ground, sometimes brought in by communications. So whether it's good or bad, you're, you're stuck with communications. But I think, I don't think it is true that an activist ambassador is just sitting there waiting for instructions. Um, in fact, I will, you know, embassies now are platforms. The State Department may even be a minority element at an embassy. They, because you've got something like 25, 26 other cabinet agencies and departments that have people overseas. And they're all sending their people instructions. I used to tell my people though in Afghanistan, if you know, you only get instructions two places from me and in a front channel telegraphic communication. Anything else is a request. If the request is in your judgment questionable, uh, or it's going to get in the way of something we're doing, you have to see me. And some, you know, they were very good. And sometimes people would come in from their agency and they would say, you know, I've got six emails on this and they're demanding I do something. We both knew it was stupid. Uh, and I'd say, well, go back and tell them the ambassador said no. 
uh, but you can call him. And the funny thing is the phone never rang. They never called me. So, you know, you can push back a lot. I mean, there's sometimes you lose. But you have a variety of ways of standing up saying no. Saying, getting what you want if that you don't have, that's harder. Um, but there are, you know, learning how to use communications channels, how to use secret messages and messages that only somebody sees. You know, this is an art that is part of learning the subject. But it's not a, it's not an, so it's not an easy question to answer. And I may have rambled too long. Ambassador Newman, thank you so much for, for uh, that answer. Um, I want to turn a little bit to the overlap of some of the domestic problems that the U.S. faces and the international problems that the U.S. faces. So, for example, we have right now, uh, we're at one of our most polarized periods in our history where we've got people who refuse to speak to each other, refuse to negotiate, uh, refuse to compromise. Um, and, and so that domestic uh, problem is really creating problems globally for us. And, and we're seeing a resurgent China that's willing to, to, to challenge our, our um, uh, unipolarity and um, our uh, position globally. We see Russia challenging us in, in Ukraine, uh, not globally, but in Ukraine itself. And we see lots of, of international challenges. Um, if we are seeing such a challenge and the emergence of a more multipolar world, how would that impact the United States? Well, if you can't have too many permanent alliances, you're going to have to do a heck of a lot, a very good job in keeping pe people together when you need help. And so, so far, there has been a, a really commendable standing together of uh, a broad number of countries, not just the West, on Ukraine. Uh, many of the issues require coalitions. All this requires a lot of diplomacy. One of the things we're doing in this blueprints report you mentioned, in addition to the reserve force, is advocating for more long-term proper professional education of diplomats. The military does this regularly, um, you know, and we don't. We do very, very little. We, we get brilliant people, and then we hope they figure it out on the job because we haven't got any space or time to train them. Uh, and we're going to have to do more of that. So from, you know, across the word, we're, we're going to have to just have a top flight diplomatic corps for the 21st century because secretaries of state and presidents can call people and they can buzz around the world. But there's an enormous amount of spade work that has to be done. George Schultz used to call it tending the garden, that you, you've got to constantly work on your diplomacy. And for that, we need a top flight diplomatic corps. We need to train them, we need to educate them, uh, and we need to have the Reserve Corps so that we don't always have to gut what we're doing one place to stamp a crisis. Excellent. Ambassador Newman, I'm going to change a little bit and ask you about your experience as a diplomat and ambassador. You served the government for a long time. You were an ambassador in three countries. And I'm going to ask a little bit about the management of the State Department uh, and address the role of the Secretary of State uh, within that, within your experience. Which of the, the Secretaries of State had the best uh, management skills and were the strongest advocates for American foreign policy and, in your judgment, did the best job in guiding American foreign policy? Oh, that's a big question. Um, and <laughs> I don't think one can make that any judgment yet about the current administration. That's that's too soon. <laughs> in terms of guiding foreign policy, uh, probably the ones that would stand out would, would be Henry Kissinger and Jim Baker uh, and George Schultz. Uh, all had notable roles. In terms of the state, the management of the State Department itself, I think George Schultz particularly strongly because he protected and defended his people in a way that was almost unique. 
Uh, <coughs> but also Colin Powell, uh, famous for asking somebody to look at a an outgoing ambassador, look at a globe and say, show me your country. And when the person would point to someplace in Africa, they'd say, no, no, your country is the United States. That's what you're going out to represent. Uh, so, you know, there, there have been another people who fought for the budget, Powell and Clinton. Uh, very few have actually fought for their budget. So I think you'd have to score different people differently on different characteristics. In terms of closeness to the president in order to manage policy, Kissinger and Baker would stand out. Uh, that they were Because the Secretary of State, at the end of the day, does not make policy. He implements policies that are decided by the president. And so the bond between them and the intellectual understanding between the two of them is key to an effective secretary. Great. Ambassador Newman, I'd like to, we have about two minutes left. I would like to ask how uh, our exit strategy could be in Ukraine compared to Afghanistan. I realize that they're two very different situations. We're not, we, we're not fighting actually in Ukraine. We're, we're sending weapons and, and, uh, um, instead of our troops. But how could we resolve the Ukrainian crisis and the Ukrainian war in a way where um, it doesn't devolve into a war between NATO and Russia? Well, first of all, I think it's maybe, you know, not every war can have an exit strategy. There is an interrelationship with diplo between diplomacy and the battlefield. Stop trying to think about diplomatic solutions or what the shape of an agreement would be divorced from the battlefield. This is, has a great deal to do with timing. So what can, and frankly, you know, if you are going to have anything less than total success, which the Ukrainians now define as pushing the Russians out of all of Ukraine, including what they took in 2014, then that's only going to happen when both parties decide that they have a reason to quit at the same time. And the idea that you can intellectualize a solution separate from the battlefield geometry is, I, I think, a waste of time. And I'm seeing a lot of articles written that I think speculate in that realm by people who, it seems to me, have almost no understanding of warfare. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, Ambassador Newman, we are uh, finishing up or have uh, approximately one minute left. Uh, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to give to uh, students who are aspiring to be diplomats. It is a fascinating career. It's got some downsides. You know, there's, you've got to want to move. You've got to like the adventure of moving and like foreign cultures. You've got to learn to listen uh, because you, you only can make solutions with people. Remember, diplomacy is basically about getting other people to do what we want and like it enough that we can work with them on the next problem. And to do that, you have to understand them. But for those who like the challenge and they have the skills, it's a fascinating career. And I would say that, you know, 37 years, I never looked back once and thought, am I, does what I'm working on matter? Uh, there were plenty of times that I didn't get the answer I wanted from a problem, but I never wondered if what I was doing mattered. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of precious in your life. That is precious. Indeed, very rare, I'd say. Yeah. Th thank you, Ambassador Newman, for, for a very ex exciting and, and uh, very informative interview. We really appreciate it. It was a great pleasure. My thank pleasure. You. And if you would, when you uh, put it out, if you would send me a link. Of course. We'll be happy to. We'll yes. be happy to. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it.